Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm really, really excited to be in the most beautiful country in the entire world. And, and I'm sorry that I don't speak Italian. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, before I start, um, good. Um, I did want to mention that um, my great grandparents are from Sicily. Um, and even though um, I don't speak Italian and I did not grow up in Sicily, I feel very, very, very connected and very happy in a, in a very deep way when I come to Italy and get to be with Italians um, and be in this country because I feel very connected inside with, with all of you here. Um, and everyone I've met has been so beautiful and lovely always from Italy. Thank you. Um, so thank you for having me here. I'm so appreciative to Mirta to putting this on. I'm going to talk a little bit about her in this program, but she wanted me to share with you a project that I started um, in Oregon um, called the Culinary Breeding Network. So I'm just going to kind of go through that and talk about where that came from, what it is, um, but feel free to interrupt me, um, raise your hand, or just say something like it's very informal. You can, and if I'm talking too fast, just let me know. Or if I say something you don't understand what I'm saying, just ask me. So again, my name is Lane Selman, um, and I'm from I'm coming here from Oregon, Portland, Oregon, which is in the northwest part of the United States, and it's very similar uh, weather climate to here. I grew up though actually in Florida, which is similar climate to Sicily, and uh, I grew up on a farm, a citrus farm, uh, but I moved away um, to Oregon and have been working with vegetables at Oregon State University, so I'm a, I'm a professor there, but I don't teach, I do research, and then I do a lot of outreach um, projects to try to get information to uh, people and do a lot of things like this that Mir just put on for us today. I'll tell you about some of those things. <clears throat> Okay, so um, like I said, I work on research projects. Um, this is a project that was in 2005 when I started, first started working for the university. Uh, we called it O-SPUD. SPUD is a word that we call potatoes, SPUD, um, just kind of like a dialect word. Um, so I'll say also, like I work on all organic projects, right? So I work on all organic projects and I work on all projects in which um, the farmers are, we work very, very closely with the farmers. We call, it's called participatory. So they're participating in the research with us. So it's not like, um, oh, we are at the university and we know a lot and we're going to tell you what to do. It's more like we're a group of individuals um, that are university researchers and farmers that are working together to try to explore problems, right? And try to solve those problems together. So this uh, was a project that we worked on for two years, and even though all these people that are in this photo are farmers and they grow a lot of different vegetables, um, and they sell like CSA, they sell the farmers markets, so they're directly selling to their customers a lot like the farmers that are here and that I've met. Um, and again, they're organic. They grow a lot of different things, but they specifically had a lot of problems with potatoes, and they had disease problems and insect problems. Um, that we were investigating, and we had questions about um, fertilization and nutri you know, nutrition of their crop. So we were investigating all of those things. Um, and during this project, um, the disease was a problem. So it was late type, uh, late blight -like Phytophthora, and that is a problem in a lot of different places. And that's what caused the potato famine uh, in Ireland in the 1800s, right? So it's still a big problem where we live. We have a very conducive environment. It's cool, wet. Um, so the the, back, the the fungus fungus does very well there, right? So um, so we were looking at different ways to control it organically and different things that they could do, um, and then we decided to look at the seed that we were getting. So we said, well, there's all these different varieties. Let's trial them, right? Let's plant them out in a lot of different air, you know, in a lot of different farms, a lot of these people's farms, because that's where the real like research happens at a university farm. A lot of times, it's not similar to a, a real actual farm, right? So we want to grow it in the actual place where it's going to be grown. So they trialed them, um, and we found that some ha just naturally had late blight resistance, and some didn't, so we were very interested in that. And then we invited the university plant breeders that specifically worked in potatoes to come to one of our meetings to talk uh, to us. And they said, um, you know, we, we asked them, like, what were they working on? Uh, you know, things that before they're commercially available, before the farmers can actually buy those things. We said, what are you working on? And they said, oh, we have all different types of potatoes. And we have lots that have late light resistance. 
and this was about after two years of this project. And I thought, oh God, I should have had all you know these plant breeders come and talk to us a long time ago. And the plant breeders are talking, and one of the farmers said, well, how does this one taste? And the plant breeder said, oh, all of them taste terrible, which is ridiculous, right? It's like, well, then who cares? Like, why would we want those potatoes? And then we start talking to them about that, and they were mostly breeding potatoes for french fries, right? And so they're going to be fried, they're going to have a lot of salt, they have oil. It really doesn't matter what the potato actually tastes like. So we're like, well, this is useless. We don't want anything that you have to offer because we want the potatoes to actually taste good. Um, so that was really curious to me. And like I said, this in this picture, there's, there's university professors, researchers, and there's farmers that grow for the market, right? Produce farmers. So then the next project I started working on, this one is called NOVIC, which is the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. So a collaborative of individuals trying to improve vegetables, right? Um, and in this picture, there's a lot of the same people, but there's, there's researchers and um, there's also plant breeders, because we, we said we didn't bring the plant breeders into this conversation. There's farmers that grow vegetables for the market. And then there's also seed growers. We have a lot of seed growers where we live in um, Oregon and Washington is one of the best places in the world to grow seed. Um, it's a very fertile valley. Uh, it rains a lot, so you don't have to irrigate a ton, but then it gets dry all during the summer, like in, starting in July, it gets dry. And it's dry typically before climate change, but typically until about um, October. So during the harvest, when you don't want your seed crop to be wet, um, it's not wet, right? So it's, per it's a perfect place. So we grow a lot of seeds, so we invited all those people to be a part of the project. So it's now, now the projects are, um, you know, you're just getting a lot more information there because you're bringing in those seed people because they make so many important decisions before the farmer even gets the seed, right? They're making all the selections and decisions. Um, so this is a project that's led by OSU, where I am, and then Organic Seed Alliance is a nonprofit association uh, in northern Washington, but they work all, all over the world, really. Um, they work a lot in Europe, in France quite a bit, and the Netherlands, at Vatigan, um, but they are, um, they're based in um, Washington, and then University of Wisconsin, that's in the middle of the the country and then Cornell University, which is in New York. So the northern part, so it's very uh, similar latitude and we can grow a lot of the same things. So there are plant breeders at each one of those institutions that focuses at least some of their work on breeding specifically for organic systems. Um, and we need very different things in organic systems, right? We need things, we need plants that can grow well without herbicides, that can grow well without know, insecticides um, that have they, there's different nutritional um, management that they just we just need very very different things right for an organic system so they think about those things and they make sure that the things um, the vegetables that they're breeding grow agronomically well in an, on an organic farm um, and in this project we work on a lot of different vegetables here's some cabbage here um, and again it's very farmer led so to so the thing ends in um, in the United States of America. We have um, we have you know organic certification, um, but there's a problem with it because it does not actually um, require that you use organic seed. So if there's not organic seed available for the particular variety that you want to grow, you can grow it. You can grow conventional seed, right? And conventional <coughs> seed doesn't like I said, it does not meet the needs of the, the organic grower typically. Um, and this is a very scary picture. <laughs> that is a global problem. This is not a problem for just the people in the United States. It's a problem for Italians. It's a problem for the whole entire world, right? So what this is showing, it's hard to read it, and I could send this to uh, Mirta to send out to you guys if you want this whole presentation. Um, so the red, um, so I'll start with the blue. The blue um, are seed companies, right? and the red are chemical companies. So here what we're seeing, and this, this looked very different. This is from 1996 until 2018. 
Um, all of these blue were very independent and there are lots of them, a lot more of them. And so what we're seeing is companies coming together, seed consolidation, a big company buying a smaller company, merging of companies, right? And so now when you look at these big red circles, that's Bayer, this is Corteva, this is ChemChina, and they own over 60% of all of the genetics um, in the world. Um, so this is why these companies are not offering uh, varieties that do very well for organic farmers because they're also making chemicals and they want you to use you know, varieties that depend on these chemicals, right? So this is a very big problem. Um, this is a plant breeder from University of Wisconsin, I think, who said it nicely, who said, even if we assume that one or two companies controlling a crop or completely altruistic, um, it's extremely dangerous to have so few people making decisions that will determine the future of a crop. The future of our food supply requires genetic diversity, but also demands a diversity of decision makers. Um, so he's a corn breeder at University of Wisconsin who has been a breeder for 40 years and has seen a lot of changes. Um, he's a public breeder, um, and so we're also seeing a lot less public breeders um, at universities and more private, and the private are usually going down this road of these companies, right? Um, so it's very, very important that we have like this grassroots movement of these individuals that are saving the seed that we actually need to be grown without chemicals, right? Um, so to get back to that project, that Novik project, one year, we asked the farmers what, you know, we worked on like six different crops at a time, and we said, what uh, crop would you like us to work on? And they said, well, we really would like you to work um, on uh, trialing different peppers. So these are, we actually call them Italian peppers, so they're, Ita they're peppers that are like long, these happen to be red, um, that you can roast. So you can eat them raw or you can saute them, but they're really nice roasted. They have thick walls, the skin peels off nicely, right? And so it's pretty powerful to have a lot of farmers in a room together. And this doesn't happen often for farmers who are very busy doing their, I mean, how many farmers do we have here? Yes. Do you get together all together a lot and talk about no. the issues, right? <laughs> it doesn't happen. So you have, kind of have to create these opportunities, right? Because that's, you know, for me in these projects that I work on, that's the power. Is like I don't even really have to do anything as the researcher. I just am trying to bring everybody together in a way that you guys can have the conversations to answer the questions and learn from one another. Um, so... This is what happened in this room when uh, one farmer, she said, I really love this particular pepper, it's called gypsy, but I can't find enough seed of it anymore. Like I try to order from the company and they don't have enough of it. And it was a hybrid, so it, is. it was a hybrid. And then another farmer in the room said, yeah, you know, I actually had the same experience last year and couldn't find enough seed. And then someone else said, I grew it last year and there are all these off types. So an off type meaning it, the peppers on some of the plants looked very different than what gypsy is supposed to look like. And so then the power of having the seed people with us was someone who grows seed said, well, that means that company that produces that hybrid is probably no longer going to produce it. It's probably going to go away. Um, and that could be because one company is bought by another company and they, it's not an important variety for them because they already have other varieties. Um, it could be because to create a hybrid, you have to have two inbred parent lines and they get weaker and weaker over time. There's a lot of different reasons and we never usually know the reason because the seed world is a bit hidden. But to have the seed people in the, world, in like the room with us tell us some of these things that could be happening. So they said, this means that probably that variety is not going to be offered. And since it's a hybrid, no one can start growing it. Because also in the U.S., the seed situation is a bit different. We can grow anything we want, right? We can, you can grow commercially anything you want and sell the seed. You can, um, you, can you know, unless it has patents and this and that. But it's, um, we don't have like a list. Like some in the EU, I understand there's like, a variety list and these are the ones that you grow. We can we can do kind of whatever we want. So if uh, some some varieties, if they're open pollinated and you can't find them anymore, then someone else maybe in the room will say, I'll start growing that. And they start growing it and then our community has that seed. But if it's a hybrid, you know we cannot do that because we don't have these parent lines that create it. So 
it goes away, it's gone. So the farmer said, can you please trial a lot of different varieties of open pollinated peppers so that that will replace gypsy so we can stop growing, you know, they depended a lot on gypsy. They grew a lot of different peppers, but that was the one that was kind of called the workhorse, like the one that did really, really well that they could always depend on. So we said, okay, let's, let's, let's grow a lot of different peppers. So some of these peppers came from this other really cool project that Frank Morton is um, a plant breeder in Oregon. He has a company uh, called Wild Garden Seed. And I won't talk about this too long because it can get very complicated and long tangent. Um, but he had a similar situation where there was a farmer that really liked a, um, a pepper called La Prairie, and it was a hybrid. And the farmer who was growing La Prairie and really liked it, she said to Frank, I cannot, this is many years before this project that I'm talking about. Um, he, she said, um, I really love this pepper but I can no longer buy the seed um, untreated. So you know how sometimes they treat, I don't know if they do it here, but they put a fungicide on the seed and they send, the company sends you the seed like this. So in organic certification, I told you, you could, in the United States, you don't have to use organic seed, but you cannot use treated seed because that's a chemical, right? So no longer could she just order La Prairie without the chemical. So she said to Frank, she had some seed left from the year before and she gave it to Frank and said, could you possibly you know, create an open pollinated uh, pepper for me that's basically just like La Prairie. So he grew it the first year and it's La Prairie, right? They all look like this. And then he saved the seed of that, of the best plants, and then he planted it. And then what he saw really amazed him because he was used to working with lettuce and lettuce is self-pollinated, right? Um, there's a lot of posters actually that I made with the photographer who's here um, that you can, you know, you probably know many of you in here about this, but there's some posters that we try to explain to just the general public what the difference is between self-pollinated and cross-pollinated and hybrid and OP. Um, but so he was used to working with self-pollinated plants, so you didn't see very much diversity, right? But when he then planted the seed that he had saved, that is insect, you know, pollinated, um, he found a lot of different phenotypes, right? So a, a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors of, um, of peppers. And they didn't, you know, go into these categories very neatly like they are here. They were all over the place, right? There's tons of different things. And so that means that these, the parent lines, right, of this La Prairie were probably very different looking from one another. Um, so now the next generation, the F2, is expressing a lot of different genetics. Um, so then from that one, though, he kept growing year after year and selecting and putting the seeds in different piles and then growing them out. And then he created, he has like 10 different varieties now, but this is what he had when we did our, um, our project. So I said, okay, let's grow Frank's peppers um, because he has all of these really cool open pollinated peppers and nobody really knew about them. So those were in our trials. So we grew them on a lot of different farms and I went out and evaluated them. And I was really surprised because what, so what we do is we grow, we grew all of these and then we grew the one we wanted to replace. We grew the gypsy, right? The hybrid. We grew other varieties that we knew, um, you know, performed very well in organic systems so that we could compare it to those. And then we grew a lot of new peppers that were in seed catalogs that you never, you know, like, is this going to do well or not? So we trial them all so we can report back to the, the growers. And so what I saw was, like, um, these, these peppers grew amazing. They were wonderful. They had lots of um, leaves so they didn't get sun scald. I was talking to somebody, uh, I said back, I don't remember, I can't remember his name. <laughs> I was talking to somebody last night, he was telling me all about his pepper problem. So they stood up straight, they didn't fall over, um, they didn't get disease. Um, they did very, very well uh, on these organic farms. But one thing we were not doing was tasting them, right? So, and that's very important. I don't have to tell Italians that, but sometimes the Americans forget. They're like, oh, whatever. <laughs> we don't need to taste them. So that was the one thing we were not doing. And I wanted to make sure before I told the farmers to plant, like, yes, plant these peppers. They're wonderful. I knew they were wonderful in the field, but I did not know if they were wonderful on the plate. 
So we, I know a lot of chefs <laughs> and um, I worked at a farmer's market where I met, you know, chefs come all the time to, to, um, to buy uh, produce and uh, vegetables. So I asked them if they want to get together and, you know, taste peppers. And of course, all of them said, yes, we want to. And so I had them all get together and we tasted the peppers. So when you taste it in a tasting, uh, we flip the, you don't see the name, right? So it just has a code on it. Uh, and we tasted them sauteed, raw, as well as roasted. Um, and then they look at them too. We have them whole and we have them halved and they rate them basically. They get a ballot and they rate them from like one to nine on appearance and flavor and texture. Um, and this is sweetness and just their overall liking. So this is what we do in like a university system, right? We're like, okay, we got to have the clipboard. We got to have like put the numbers and then we're going to take the numbers and put it into the computer. And the statistics program is going to like give me the answer, right? <laughs> but it doesn't ever usually work that well. And I always like to say, I'm not a very good scientist, but I'm very good at talking to people. So we did this and there's all, there's like 30 chefs that were together. And it was like on a Monday in the middle of the day, we did the tasting. You don't talk to each other during the tasting. Um, and then as soon as we were done, we opened up some Prosecco and we just, you know, started talking to one another. And then, then they started answering all the real questions that I had, which you never get this way, right? All the numbers. Um, and what happened was they started describing to me exactly what they really wanted in a pepper. And so this one, and this one, these both came from Frank Morton's La Prairie, right? And so when, when Jolene, who was the farmer, who said, can you create something that's an open pollinated like La Prairie, he asked her, what are the traits that you want? And she said, I want a beautiful pepper that's crumply, like, like it looks like the Renaissance pepper, right? You know, it has like the, the sunken top and it's big and it's thick walls and it's crumply and it's, you know, very beautiful, right? Um, and... Then, like I said, Freight created a lot of different ones that have different traits. So this, like, it, it's very obvious now looking at this um, and talking in front of you. But back then, I didn't, I wasn't thinking in this way. Um, but the chef, and so these both tasted really great. The chef said, "There's no real difference in the flavor. They're both great. We love them. But this is the one that we want because this one is very straight walls. It's going to cook very evenly." And has these rounded shoulders rather than this, so it's easier. Basically, they start talking about efficiency and how quickly, much more quickly in the kitchen, um, they could cut them, um, use them, and then there's less waste because a lot of times you're going very fast and you're going to cut this like this, and what are you going to do with this? Maybe you're going to use it for something else, but maybe it just goes into the compost, you know? Um, so they said for the kitchen efficiency, we want this. Um, so that was something that... I would have never got from the ballot, right? The numbers would have never told me that. I had to talk to people. And then that's when I realized I'm, I'm not a plant breeder. You know, I said, you really need to be talking to the plant breeder. So then I said, in these projects, we have to have not just the, the farmers and the researchers and the seed people and the plant breeders. Now we got to have the chefs, right? We need to all come together because they need to be talking about this very early on. You know, Andrea's in the back and he's a plant breeder. He knows, like, it takes a very long time to create a new variety. So we need to know what those traits are that we want. Plant breeders that aren't working in kitchens don't know, don't think like this, right? We all have our specialty and we all need to be working together. So this is Frank Morton. And what I told you, he's used to working. He works a lot with lettuce. He worked a lot with self-pollinated plants. The, the purpose of this picture is to show you this is lettuce that's going to seed. He does this work. He's amazing. He does it. He's alone. Like he's not talking to anyone. He doesn't even have time to, you know, he's busy, but this is what he's doing. And these are, this is one of his plots where these are siblings. It's a, he crosses, he decides what he's going to cross. And then these are the siblings. And he walks through there and determines what he's going to keep and what he's going to throw out. And nobody else is giving him any ideas. He's good at what he does. He has good ideas. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that he, like, there's other people that have an intimate relationship with, with lettuce in the kitchen that, you know, he should be talking to, I thought, as well. So we have these, um, we want to be able to bring the other people into the plant breeding conversation. 
So the first time we did this, the next year, we tasted those same peppers again to repeat the process. And then we also um, brought them some breeding lines. So this is a project that was not, um, it wasn't like seed that was yet available, commercially available. This was a breeding project that was in process. So this is a habanero pepper, right? Which is usually quite hot. Um, and so this, these are very low, low heat or even sweet peppers, right? And so um, there's a researcher at <coughs> Oregon State who was working on them and we had the chefs taste them and tell us which ones that they like the best because the, research, the, the, the plant breeder knew these are the ones that grow the best. These have the traits that I want as far as, you know, the plants don't split, um, they're early. We, it's hard to grow tropical plants, I mean, tropo, yeah, tropical plants where we are because it's a longer season. He was doing all the breeding that was appropriate agronomically, but he didn't know, like, with the shape and the size and the color and the flavor that people wanted. So we had them come and taste those and be part of that breeding project. And that's really like the birth of the Culinary Breeding Network. I start, I named it that as um, the mission to build community um, between plant breeders and seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, people that are buying produce that goes into our grocery stores, right? Um, chefs and others, other people that want to improve quality in vegetables and grains. So that's improving the farming quality, the agronomic quality, as well as the culinary quality. Um, so it's a lot of interaction together. And we looked at that picture that showed like, you know, the chemical companies, but when I think about the individuals, the farmers and what their values are and what they care about are some of the things on this, um, this onion. Um, um, you know, preserving heirloom varieties and flavor is a really big, um, uh, something that we really value. Uh, environmental health, farm worker rights, um, you know, open source genetics, nutritional value of different varieties, traditional breeding methods, social justice. So it's all of these things. It's not just um, how well it grows, but it's an entire movement of wanting to improve our food system from a cultural and social um, aspect as well. And in the middle is climate chaos because it really, we do have to have those chemical companies are not creating varieties that are going to take us into the future where everything is changing, the weather is changing. They're not um, adapt, you know, adaptable. They are not resilient to these things. They're very, um, they're very needy on the chemicals in which they need to be grown with to perform well, right? Uh, we always say they're prima donnas. They have to have everything. We have to give them all the water that they want. We have to give them all the fertilizer. We really want, we need stronger plants, right? And so that's what we're trying to do is like breed for resilience and, and uh, climate change. So some of the things that we we do, right? We, me, I'm doing, <laughs> it's a small group, just me typically doing them. <laughs> You'll meet some, I'll show you about some of the, the events though where it's more collaborative. But um, designing um, events like this that Mirta has done, right? That's bringing the community together um, to try to have more interaction and collaboration between the seed folks, um, the seed people, um, the farmers, the chefs, all of the people, right? Um, so one of those things that I do is called the Variety Showcase. Um, I've done eight of those events. Um, <clears throat> this is one that's coming up <clears throat> next month. I've done them in, this one was in New York City, uh, most of them in four in Portland, Oregon, one in New York City, two in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> try to pick the nice places. <laughs> and, um, and so what this is, is um, it's a big event that brings together a lot of different people. This is, um, so this is just the people that were participating, that had the tables. We had 600 people, no, 540 a, people at the last one that we had in Portland. Um, and so at each of the tables, there's a plant breeder or a researcher that's paired up with a chef. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Um, they're trying to explain the breeding work and what plant breeding is, why it's important, and, um, and then have a chef that makes it all, you know, very nice to, because nobody wants to just look at things and, you know, want to eat it too, right? Um, so this is an example of a table where you would go to a table and you would see they, sometimes they are actually commercially available where you can go out and buy the seed and sometimes it's a breeding project, right? So it helps the plant breeder make the decisions that they need to make. 
So these are all like Hungarian paprika peppers. So you can look at the different ones and taste the powder. You can look at them dried and fresh. Um, here is some beets. And you got to taste them roasted, so cooked, as well as raw. And then look at them, just tell, you know, see what you think about them just visually, right? There's fennel, tasting them raw, and then also just looking at them, seeing what you think. This is a really cool uh, carrot breeding project. And so this is breeding carrots that um, do well in organic systems. So that the focus is like the, the things that do well for organic farmers and taste good. So flavor, organic systems, nutrient content is a big part of this project. That's why you're seeing a lot of different um, colors there. So you get to actually be part of this project. They've been doing this for five years. You get to look at them and taste them and talk to the plant breeder at the table and tell that person what you think um, about them because they don't get a lot of opportunities to talk to the public about what the public wants. And if they spend all that time, they create something and then they try to sell it and it's not something that, I mean, immediately we're, t we're judging with our eyes on whether or not we like something. And if the public doesn't like it, they're not even gonna get to the part where they're gonna taste it and it's gonna taste great, right? So then, so you get to do that. And then the, for instance, these are the two plant breeders. So they work together um, to breed the carrots and then, <laughs> and then we get the chef that makes like a really cool dish that's fun for people to try. And so um, I always say it's a trick. We say, we're having this wonderful food event. Please come, all these wonderful chefs are gonna be there. It's gonna be all these things to, to taste. And then, then we give them a lot of information about plant breeding. But so it's educational and it's also fun and delicious. <coughs> this, is a, this is Frank Morton, who I was telling you about. And so he also works with parsley, parsley from all different parts of the world. They taste very different in different parts of the world. Um, so he got seed from a database where um, um, they got, she got, he got seed from Macedonia and Turkey and Poland and all these different places and grew them out. And then the pastry chef made a nice granita with it. Um, this is some tomoncino squash. Um, we like to, to we like to have a lot of Italian vegetables. So so there's a um, this is the one. This is Jim Myers who had the mild habanero. So the sweet habanero and some tomoncino squash that he's working on. And then we also work with grains as well. So I was going to quickly tell you, this is a PhD student. Now he's graduated. He's now a breeder. And he was breeding different wheat with this baker. Um, and made some really beautiful breads. Uh, and then this is Bill, the one that had the, the, the quote earlier. And also another quote from him is just about how excited people are about plant breeding when they come to an event like this, because most of the time, like I said before, like the seed world is like hidden from the, the public. Like you go to the farmer's market and you meet the farmer and it's really great, but you don't see the person that makes a lot of decisions before the farmer. The farmer can only do what, you know, it's like 50-50, right? Genetics and environment. The farmer can only do as good as what the seed that they start with is, right? So it's really cool for them to be able to have this event in which they get to talk about plant breeding. Okay, so the other way that, like, so there's these events, but then also the Culinary Breeding Network, like, works um, with lots of different other projects, right? So um, we have a small farms team um, where we support for small farmers. We work with barley. Um, yeah, I'll tell you about the Eat Winter Squash and some other projects. And then, like I told you, Novik. So the role in those projects um, is to like build community, um, find people to work with that are in the public and chefs um, so that we can be more successful. <laughs> so mar like marketing campaigns um, that eat winter squash. So in the United States, most people are eating just a couple of different types of winter squash. They don't know about the variety that there is in squash. And there's a lot of squash that's not popular that actually grows better for farmers and, and stores better is the big problem, right? Um, but it's really hard to get people to eat um, seasonally. I mean, I live in a place where a lot of people do eat seasonally, but I live in Portland, Oregon. It's like a, it's like a dream, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice place where we have a lot of people that do that, but the rest of the country is not doing that. So they don't know when things are available. They will go and buy tomatoes in the middle of the winter time at the grocery <laughs> store, you know. And so we're trying to get them very excited about eating winter squash in this project. So we have a, um, a website 
eatwinnersquash.com. You can go there and there's chefs. <laughs> yeah. So there's chefs there that have um, created recipes. There's there's videos of them showing you how to cut, butcher, you know, cut up because people are afraid to grow um, grow winter. I mean, to cut winter squash here uh, in Italy, it's a beautiful thing where you cut you cut it in wedges and you sell it like that. In the United States, you can't sell it like this. It's like unsanitary for food safety. So people have to buy a big squash, and those a lot of times taste great, but they just don't know how to cut it. It's just, you know, it's a lot of um, education to get people excited. And then everyone's so busy, and they don't want to cook. And I think you have a lot of the same challenges as well, even though we like to romanticize that Italians are just at home cooking. It seems like maybe you're not. <laughs> Um, so this is great. This, uh, we have another campaign called Eat Winter Vegetables. Um, this is specifically these vegetables here. So winter squash, garlic, celeriac, the celery root, um, cabbage, cauliflower, radicchio, um, Brussels sprouts, and purple sprouted broccoli. And in this um, project, we have a lot of events. So we do field days. We do sagre, which is inspired by Italians. Um, we do this variety showcase. Um, and then we also have a, a website, eatwintervegetables.com. Um, so here is our sagra that we just had. And so it was a farmer's market that we call fill your pantries because it's filling the pantry for the winter time and buying things that, you know, store well. And so the sagra part of it, um, we have, and Daniel's here with us, um, we have different chefs that make dishes that people can taste that are really easy to make at home. They taste great, but you can make them at home. They taste them. It's, you know, the whole thing is free. Um, we get grants from the government to, to, to do this. And then they have the, the recipe right there. And hopefully, and then it's on the website. People go home and like they buy more of it and then they cook it at home, right? So it's really cool. It's, I mean, we had a thousand people there this year. There were 30 farmers that sold at the, um, the market and they made $87,000. What is that in euro? I'm not sure. 100, I don't know. Um, so really, really, really fantastic um, to have these events and get people really excited about winter vegetables like Mirta is doing here. So we have this Saga de Radicchio um, that happened in Seattle. This is an event that um, I organized with uh, many others. So um, Jason is here, Jason and Siri in the middle there. Um, she has a Treviso shirt on. Um, we also had a, 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 an artist make earrings for Radicchio. Um, so, and this is um, Cassie, who's also here with us, and other and some um, restaurants that are in Seattle all put on this sagra. And um, this has been very popular. About 350 people came last year. Um, and so they get to, you get to go to a table and taste just raw, like a, all these different types of radicchio, right? Um, that people don't even know about, right? Because mostly we see in the grocery stores in the United States, the Chioggia, the round one, and that's it. They certainly don't know about Rosa di Gorizia and all these things, you know, they're starting to. Um, but there's a lot of education that needs to happen. So we have that and you can taste them in like the chefs make really great dishes. And we try to get the kids in, like involved. This is my son, Pasquale. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we try to make it really fun and interactive, but also educational to try to change people's minds. Um, so now this is the age of radicchio we've decided in the United States of America. This is what we're trying to do, and this is one of the reasons we came here. Um, this is a photo that Sean, the photographer, made. We did this in her home of the different types of radicchio that's being grown, not widely in the United States, but, but a lot of the Americans that have come here to travel here to learn more about it, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, so we are growing some of these um, and they're hard to come by, like I said. You see, you see the Kyoja quite a bit in the grocery stores, but all these other things are only grown um, really locally, and people are buying at farmers markets. Um, but people are very, especially chefs, people that are into food are very, very excited about it. Um, we, so there's lots of um, uh, articles that are coming out, and, and this one just came out: the age of ridicule is upon us, right? And, a, and then, and so that you know what has really helped is the Rosa de Gorizia and these all these other Rosas. Like people see this and they freak out. It took it took years for me to finally get through to people that it's not lettuce. It's not lettuce. It's ridicule, right? So people are very very excited about it. It's all over Instagram, all this. Um, so. 
and this is really important and wonderful for us in the Pacific Northwest because, like I said, it's a place where um, we can grow a lot of the same things, that, you know, and we want people to eat locally. That's what all of these, these campaigns are about, right? But what happens where we live is, like, there's wonderful, beautiful, tasty things that are being grown in the summertime. Um, and people go to the market and they love it and it's very social and they buy a lot of things and then it starts to rain. And it starts to rain, it starts to get cold, and even though all the farmers are out there selling, the public is like, ah, I don't want to go, it's rainy, it's cold, I'm just going to go to the grocery store, and I just buy some lettuce and some tomatoes and some cucumbers from Southern California or Mexico, right? So we really want them, but it's more challenging, as you know, it's bitter, it's like we have to get them to uh, try something very different than they're used to. And some people are very receptive and others are not. Okay, so a couple other projects um, that I will tell you about really quickly is developing a lexicon of flavor. Um, this is something um, that we did to, um, I had a farmer that said, I really want to um, have you create something like a flavor wheel to describe the flavors in tomatoes and peppers and all these different things. So we, we are already working quite a bit on winter squash, so we started with winter squash. So we had a lot of different, um, these are all people that are either professional chefs or winemakers or coffee roasters. So people with very, you know, trained palates, right? So we got together and we tasted different types of, um, these are all uh, Maxima species, squash, raw, and then also like pure, um, steam and puree, and taste them and then describe the words that they would use for the flavors and created like a flavor wheel. And I do have, I have um, some of those up here that you guys can take if you want, and then also a, um, that came from the Saga de Radicchio is these little Radicchio booklets. I don't have tons of them, but there are some here that kind of we tried, as Americans, we tried to describe what we knew about Radicchio and all the different types. And so if you want to take one of those, that's, in, that's up here too. Um, and then I worked with Adriano, who I think stepped out, and Antonio, who is also here, um, to present the, the flavor wheel um, at a conference in Washington. Um, uh, and we did it with, um, with the squash and olive oil and honey and also wine uh, and had people kind of really start to try to think. I feel like Italians do this much more so than Americans where you think a lot more about what you're experiencing and describe it. There's more conversation around it. So it's something that's very new that Americans have to really um, start to really train themselves to use that type of language and talk about it more. Uh, so it's kind of a guide. It's not, you know, definitive. It's not like this is the only thing you can be tasting. It's just like a to help start your thinking. Okay, something I call suitcase seeds. So facilitating the movement of seeds from one place to another. Um, and so Mirta is our help here. So when Mirta, oftentimes, oftentimes we cannot get seed that we really want. Um, and and Mirta has helped us find. Um, some seed that we really could not get, and but it is common in Europe, and then she brings it to us. And a lot of times I bring um, seeds from the U.S. here for people. I have a stack of them for, for Adriano, and then go back and forth. But what has happened um, is there's, these are beets that are from France. Um, this is actually like Rosa di Grizia, but it's like, he calls this one Isantina, but it's, I mean, it shouldn't be, right? Because he's growing it in Washington. But, um, you know, just playing around with trying to figure out how to do the forcing. And this is also, this is fenugreek, uh, trichinella, trichinella that's in the bread from around here. And so um, Mirta has brought these things to us, and not just to farmers that grow it and we enjoy it, but actually to a seed company that's a small seed company, and they've started growing it, and now we have the seed there. So if farmers want it, you can get these beets now where we live that we couldn't get before. So that's very exciting. And she's obviously very excited. <laughs> uh, and Mirta has just been a really wonderful, um, uh, you know, part of our community. She, uh, she always says, like, she's been adopted to Oregon. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is the farm. This is at the farm where she has worked. Um, when she was in Oregon. This is a friend of ours, uh, Sarah Minnick, who has been here before. She has a pizza and uh, gelato place in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and she uses the trigonella. She uses all the things. Um, and this is a farmer um, <coughs> who is at Ayers Creek Farm, where, where Mirta, one of the farms where she worked when she was in Oregon. 
um, and they grow, um, they call it Art Cape for our area, but they basically grow the Treviso Tardiva in our area. People are trying to figure that out and he does it very well. Um, and this is just us uh, all there together um, and her, with her Oregon family. Um, and she's been so wonderful to put together this Radicchio expedition. So like I told you, like we're really trying to figure out a lot more, understand a lot more about Radicchio. All the, uh, so there's 22 people from the United States that are here with me. And initially, Mirta said, I want to put on this thing, this jazz, will you come to it and help me because you do the things in, you know, in Oregon and we can do it together. She says that, but she basically did everything. Um, <laughs> um, but, and she said, well, we should, we should probably go on a tour too. I said, okay. And I had maybe, you know, two farmers with me and a chef. So there's maybe five people that were going to come and then people started hearing about it and then we brought 22 people. So <laughs> she organized this amazing program for us. We arrived on Monday in Bologna and we went to Fonavrisa and then we've gone to so many farms um, at least two a day, but sometimes four a day where um, we've gone and visited um, to see how people are growing um, Rigio, how they're forcing it. Um, it's just been really incredible. Big farms, small farms, everything. We've learned so much and so grateful um, to have her in our lives. And with this, because it is like a cultural exchange that um, I really hope continues into the future. And I hope to, I'm writing a grant right now to hopefully um, have a symposium where we like present all this information to the farmers in the U.S., bring over Italians for that, come back over, and so maybe have like a cultural exchange between us because I think it's very... Um, it's a wonderful thing to come here and, and learn about traditions because this is something we're very much lacking in the United States is any sort of tradition really, you know, with our food. Um, so we really look to you and appreciate um, the food culture that's happened here. Um, and we, it is something that is like missing from us. We feel it. The people that are here feel it. So we come to you to, to, to find that, you know, and to have happiness, you know, so I want to thank Mirta so much. Um, she's not here, but <laughs> I want to thank her because she has really done a really wonderful thing um, for us to bring us all together. And I just wanted to say last, um, there is, if you want to see more information, there's a website and there's also an Instagram that I use quite a bit and um, post a lot of pictures of what plant, plant breeders are doing um, so that people in other parts of the world, it's incredible, you know, like other people, and other parts of the world can see um, what these people are doing because, like I said, it's, it's hidden. It's not something that we normally see, and it's really wonderful to actually all be a part of that process together. So that is what I had to say, but I want to, uh, I want to hear from anyone if um, you have reactions to this or ideas or how you feel about it. If you want to come to the United States to talk, we can take you. We can take you to a lot of different farms. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I do. I, I did. So like I said, there's some Z, like the little booklet is up here, and the flavor wheels, and some stickers just to tell you what this one says. Bitter is better. Trying to get people excited about Amaro, and this one says eat winter vegetables. So little and some buttons and stuff. So feel free to take whatever you want, and um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.